All right, looking at uh, the uh, special notes, and for those who will uh, hear this uh, later uh, out uh, in other parts of the world, when uh, you will see a video of this, uh, we are looking at a special section in the large prayer syllabus, a syllabus of more than 200 pages, and right today we're looking at a section that deals with special notes on uh, people like Abraham, Jacob, Job, Moses, and we've asked the students to read these uh, notes ahead of time, and then uh, any questions that we might have today will, will be aroused by uh, that reading, we trust. We will proceed then from that standpoint. As we look at uh, these great uh, people of prayer, we have Abraham, and you've read some of the issues about Abraham here. If there are any questions, I want to entertain those. Uh, feel free then to bring up questions about Abraham here in relationship to prayer. Uh, when you're thinking about that, remember that what we've mentioned in the um, couple of paragraphs that we have given on Abraham is only a very small part of uh, something like, I think it was 105 pages that I uh, personally did on, on the prayer life of Abraham. Because there are many different verses in uh, Genesis 12 through 25 uh, where Abraham is before us in Genesis, uh, where there are verses that talk about prayer. And uh, we've just uh, selected out of that mass of material a uh, very few examples here. We, we took the example, for example, of, um, for instance, of um, Genesis 18 when he prayed intercessory prayer uh, in regard to uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It is a great example of intercessory prayer. Maybe there are questions about this. What did you think of Dick Eastman's viewpoint in paragraph two? That Abraham failed in prayer by praying only six times. And uh, did not uh, fill it on out to the seventh time or the seven, the number of completeness sometimes in scripture. What do you think about that kind of uh, exegesis? Not good, huh? Uh, intruding something that is not in the passage itself at all. Nothing in the passage uh, calls our attention to Abraham failing to start with, and uh, also nothing calls our attention to his failing by uh, not going on to an additional or a seventh uh, step of prayer. Okay, as he asked God to, uh, to uh, spare uh, the uh, sinners, should there be, uh, the city, should there be uh, so many righteous people there. All right, question, yes, please. Why, why do you think he prayed for the city when he knew it was immoral and worthy of God's punishment, instead of just praying that God would pull out the righteous? I really don't know the answer. The, the question is, why did he pray for the city since it was so immoral, so unrighteous? Why not just pray directly for the righteous? I, I really don't know why he did that. I would say he could do it either way, and he chose to do it this way. And uh, probably he started with a large, larger number because he wanted to... Um, Start with a very general large number uh, to um, begin his prayer that way, hoping for the very best, hoping for the most that might be found there who would be worthy, and then finally getting it down to the very few that he personally might have known about. But I don't know the answer to your question. It's a good question. Hopefully I can do better on other questions. I uh, wish I knew all the answers. When we second guess uh, biblical people, we don't always know. Because we haven't had a personal interview with them to find out why they, why they did this. Don't know. And a very astute question. Are there others? who maybe have something to, to uh, contribute about Abraham. 
I hope you see the uh, arguments I've given in paragraph two in answer to Eastman. Uh, why it, uh, in my opinion, is uh, to falsify the passage to assume what Eastman assumes. I think he's read something in there. It's merely his opinion rather than uh, something that we would uh, hermeneutically gather from looking at the context carefully. I've tried to show that here. Nothing is emphasized in the text, for example, about Abraham failing here. Uh, where he does fail in these chapters about his life, it, isn't it rather obvious that he has failed? Yes, it is. But here, not so. Uh, so we need to be very careful that we don't intrude and, and read in uh, too much at times. Let us uh, rather uh, try to gather what is more obvious and natural to the passage itself. I think that some, uh, some teachers have a, too much of a tendency at times to want to come up with something novel or different, and we need to be very careful about that. Uh, that if we do come up with something different from what others have taught, uh, let us be very hermeneutically sure, exegetically confident, that the factors of the passage itself are there that would validate what we're saying lest we too easily, too quickly be called into question for it, as we can call Eastman's viewpoint into question here. Uh, nothing is emphasized about Abraham failing because he didn't go on to another step, but rather it even tells us in the passage that the Lord himself was pleased. So why not stop at that? Yes. Well, my question is, um, I mean, we know God holds us accountable for, you know, you do not add, receive because you do not ask. Is it, is it uh, can we assume that if we ask once and leave it up to God and don't ask again if that's enough? Let me say that uh, the question is um, why not just pray once and then leave it up to God uh, rather than uh, praying a number of different times? Uh, as far as I know from Scripture, uh, both methods uh, appear at different times and that uh, it seems to be open to uh, different people of prayer that we would uh, use different methods at different times. Uh, but that God is very gracious in caring for us, First Peter 5, 7, in whatever way we choose to pray as long as we're really seeking His will, long as we are submissive to be ready, not impudent, but ready to uh, accept His will once He makes it known. As long as we're teachable and open, receptive, so that, yes, there are many instances in Scripture where people will pray once, and that's all it takes, and uh, God does answer. Uh, we have other instances, like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, with, in that case, three times. And I think there's one in Mark that's two times. Here it's six times, or six steps, not necessarily six times, but six steps, as the, the one occasion of prayer is working its way through these different stages until it's completed. So I, I, I think we have enough examples of both of these to say that probably the better biblical answer is that there is variety on different occasions and our gracious God is willing to deal with, uh, with variety. Uh, which itself might be an encouragement to us that there's no one way that's been fixed or patented uh, and this is the way you must pray or uh, you're off base. But rather there is afforded to us um, occasion for uh, different kinds of prayers, but the uh, uh, attitudes of prayer would be important. We've been learning this semester, like waiting on God, trust, really listening, really watching, really meditating on His Word so that His Word impacts, guides, lights our prayer life, uh, so that we pray according to well-known uh, biblical principles which uh, alert us to how we can pray according to His will. And, and that is the bottom line. Once we do that, then there appear to be a variety of different uh, ways in which we, uh, methodologies that we can use in doing this. That would be my, my way of responding. But certainly God is not hard of hearing, is He? Uh, in fact, if we wanted to press the matter, even before we ask once, God knows. Uh, Psalm 139, He knows all the thoughts in our minds. The, our thoughts are far off. 
and he's acquainted with all our ways, so we really wouldn't even have to ask once. He already knows what our need is. Whether we ask once, twice, three times, or six times, or six steps, and I believe that we have many occasions in the history of the church where people have asked the same prayer maybe hundreds of times before God is pleased to bring about an answer, like the prayer of suffering of certain trials people have gone through, and they keep crying out to God, Oh, Lord, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me, day after day. And uh, God uh, may be uh, seemingly saying no, or he may be uh, saying, Wait a while until I have woven into your life patience, love, faith in greater measures. I want to uh, let you know who's really in charge here, not you, but me. So I'm the one who calls the shots, and I'm the one who calls the time when the answer will come, and, and every other thing. And it may be that God detects in certain lives more of a tendency of um, lack of patience, lack of trust, uh, more of a tendency to want to run ahead of God, and so he deals particularly with different individuals according to the needs that he perhaps, well, he always does perceive in their, in their varying situations to tutor them and bring them along, not necessarily having to deal with every individual in exactly the same way, because every individual has differing kinds of needs. And uh, he, he's very flexibly open to those and we're willing to work uh, to uh, deal with uh, uh, issues as they actually are, as they vary in those lives. So God does work in different ways, his wonders to perform as the old song has expressed it. And we need to keep in mind who really is in charge. It's God. And not insist that he, you know, give us what we have dictated, uh, no matter how much we have our hearts set on it or think it's the wise way to go at the moment. After all, he's wiser than we are, and he knows better than we do what wisdom is in a given case. And oftentimes when we have to wait, and have to ask several different times, it really does tend to uh, let us uh, show what is the true, uh, what is the true thinking in our hearts. Whether we really will, over the weeks and months, still trust him, or whether we'll say, none of that, no more of that, I can't trust him, I'll go somewhere else for my answers. In which case, probably God would say, I knew that would happen, I, uh, you know, that's just giving it time for it to be worked out that way but how much more it is to glorify him if we are willing to trust and develop patience and more trust along the way. We show our, show our real servant heart. We display our real submission uh, more uh, when, uh, when things are difficult and they continue to be difficult and we still trust him to be our sufficiency. Paul asked three times, 2 Corinthians 12, and uh, it was not just once. And uh, he learned something through that. He learned my grace is sufficient. So there was a good teaching there that, that, that finally sank home to his heart. We have Jacob. <clears throat> Jacob, in his uh, case, uh, being away from home, having left the land in Genesis 28, fearing that his brother Esau, who had been whispering his desires to murder him, would follow through on that, and so Jacob uh, left the land to save his own skin and was away for 20 years, then came back. <clears throat> when he was on his way back, he wrestled with God in chapter 32 because he had heard the reports that Esau was coming, what was it, 400 uh, in his outlaw band, and... Uh, uh, Jacob's heart was thumping in uh, great fear that when the confrontation would, uh, would come, uh, that old hatred he had seen upon his brother's face would still be there. It would be the face of a murderer and not a face of merciful um, graciousness. He prayed, he wrestled with God and said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Remember that in Genesis 32 as they wrestled through the night, God did bless him. And so that the next day in chapter 33, when Jacob did meet Esau, rather than a murderous face, it was a face of mercy. 
that God had written on Esau's face. And so then Jacob, remember, said, I have seen your face as I had seen the face of God. Interesting that several commentators have pointed out in 33.10 when he says that. They go back to 32.30, which appears within the wrestling match, where he saw the face of God. He saw the face of God in chapter 32, and then, as it were, he saw the face of God written upon Esau. And several commentators, like Derek Kidner on Genesis, others have... I've mentioned the connection of those two verses, and I, I personally believe they are connected contextually. That God was stamping, stamping upon the face of Esau, as it were, uh, a face of mercy that God had wrought within his being, so that they clasp one another in a wonderful hug, wonderful embrace of acceptance of, of brotherly love that God had wrought, and God had taken away the murderous intent of 20 years before. God had also taught Jacob a lesson about trust. Even though he walked away from that with a limp, didn't he? As God had touched the socket within his, uh, within his uh, thigh. And we learn that out of weakness he found strength. God dealt with his own Jacob kind of life by bringing him into subjection to himself. And he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He was not going to gain his blessing by his own conniving, by his own ways. But he would only have it if God would bless him, and he did. And it was evident then in chapter 33 when he met Esau. Job. Well, much of Job is actual prayer. I don't know if you've realized that, that there are the speeches of um, the, friend, the three friends of Job. There's also Job when he will respond to these, and they go through these various cycles. And chapter goes, after chapter goes by. And as you look at those chapters of his friends, those chapters where Job himself is responding, uh, much of that material actually is spoken to God in prayer. I never realized that until a few years ago when I had uh, studied the book in seminary and had not seen it, and then I began to go through it on my own looking for prayer and found it validly there. So that when I wrote my, um, my notes on, uh, on Job, I think it was something like 100 pages, just dealing with the, with the prayers of the book of Job, because there are so many of them, sometimes verse after verse. But I've only given a little bit about uh, Job here. That Job 5, 8, and 9, uh, verses I memorized when I was back at Arizona State University, when I was going through the topical memory system of the Navigators, and then finishing that, decided to launch out upon my own, my own choices of verses. To add to those, what was it, 108 verses, something like that, and then added Job 5 and 8, 5, 8, and 9, uh, where it's actually Eliphaz, one of the three friends of Job, who says, But I would seek unto God, who doeth great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. Uh, whatever we may say about the fallacies of the friends of Job, uh, at times they also speak much truth in their, in their talks. And uh, I think he's speaking truth here. It is wise to seek unto God, who, do, who does great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. How true that is in Scripture and in history. I mentioned in the last line that it's good counsel, even if this friend Eliphaz misconstrues Job. We have to see that both of those factors are true within, within the context there. Much truth appears even uh, in cases where, where we also see much that is not true uh, when they have um, accused Job falsely. Any question on that, just though it's so brief in the uh, notes? I could go on, of course, you remember Job 42 where, where uh, God tells Job that he can pray for his friends and then we get into... Uh, to um, intercessory vigil there 
He does pray for them, and God does bless them. Uh, so there are other instances of prayer. We also have uh, prayers as in chapter 40, 42, where he, so to speak, falls on his face before God, learning his lesson about who he is and who God is, and humbles himself into the very dust uh, as he realizes that it's God speaking to him, and he needs to take his proper place before the Lord. And so there's repentance even in the, in the heart of, uh, and on the lips of, uh, of Job. Moses, so many passages can be cited uh, throughout the uh, books of the uh, Pentateuch, Exodus forward on uh, Moses' prayer. We've, we've selected uh, just a little bit about him here, a few passages. We have uh, Job or uh, Exodus 17 where that passage where Captain or General Joshua was leading the Israeli forces against the marauding, attacking Amalekites in the valley below. And so Moses said he would go up on the hill. And he went up there and was up there raising his rod toward heaven while Joshua was leading the forces down below in the valley. And as long as his hands were up and the rod of God was pointing toward God, uh, Joshua prevailed. But whenever through weary arms that rod would come down, Joshua would begin to prevail. Uh, the uh, enemies, the Amalekites, would begin to prevail. Uh, I've looked at a number of different commentaries, and often they will say, and I believe rightly, that, that um, the rod was a symbol of God's authority. And oftentimes when, God, when Moses would use that rod, like over the Red, he would do that over the Red Sea. He did that over the Red Sea in, in Exodus 14, and the waters parted. It was the rod in which in prayer he commanded the authority of God, and God in authority did then do that miracle. So when the rod was pointed upward, it was a sign, a tangible expression of contact with God. It was a sign of his prayer, even though prayer is specifically not mentioned in Exodus 17 there, in that passage. But it was a sign, very much like the brazen serpent in, in uh, Numbers 21, although a physical, tangible object was also depictive and stood for something. where whoever being ill would look toward this serpent would live. When they would look in faith, they would live. And so it was the object of faith in that case. So sometimes the scripture will use physical, tangible objects, which are more than just physical, tangible objects. They also are intertwined with some teaching about faith or relationship with God and so on. So I believe it is here along with a number of others. Contact with God in prayer. And the necessity of keeping up that contact for victory. And then when, his Mos when Moses' arms would become heavy, weary, remember Aaron and Hur came and hoisted his arms up so that they could be kept constant, holding the rod up. And remember then Joshua prevailed. Uh, even... Um, one pastor, I remember, used this uh, Aaron and Her idea for creating in his church Aaron and Her societies, where two people would bond to pray together before the Sunday service. And then there would be two people here and two people here and various Aaron and Her societies scattered throughout the church, all praying in their individual units for the power of God to work in the pastor's message on Sunday morning. And God did great things. A neat, neat idea based upon the way that Aaron and Hur assisted Moses. And so there are those people who, when they pray, believing God, assist the ministry of the Word. And maybe you'd like to do that in, in your... Uh, youth group or in your, the church that God puts you over, an Aaron and her situation. 
So we have lessons there, such as contact with God in prayer, and also the idea of assistance in prayer. As in Ephesians 4, different believers have different gifts. And each one with his individual gift is to uh, let that gift be used to the edification of other people. Under the furtherance of the ministry. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 there. Different gifts cooperating in the work of God. Different gifted people cooperating. The golden calf episode in Exodus 32. Any questions on that one? The main points are that Moses pleads before God, or three, as I've mentioned. He reasons this out with God. He, he, he talks to God about God's redemptive program in verse 11. And, and how his, his uh, human logic is that if God has a redemptive program, then it sort of stands to reason that God would, want, God would be the most interested to want to uh, further uh, his um, work with Israel, not wipe them out, but continue his ministry with them to build of them a nation and fulfill his Abrahamic covenant promises of Genesis 12 forward. So God's very redemption, he brought them out of Egypt. Not for nothing, but uh, for a continuing program with them. And then secondly, he pleads reputation, God's own honor, his reputation in the eyes of the unsaved people like the Egyptians. For if they see Israel's God who has delivered them out of Egypt but now fails, what will they say? They'll laugh at this. How that God uh, was not able to, to uh, bring his people through the wilderness. And so in that case, Moses, in that second part of his prayer, is pleading the very honor of God. So you can see how he was zealous for the will of God, the, the very person of God in that case, that his character would be unscathed and that he would have the proper glory in the eyes of the Egyptians by, uh, by uh, continuing to preserve his people. And then thirdly, he pleads the re remembrance of God's gracious uh, Abrahamic covenant promise from Genesis 12 forward, uh, rather than a people being wiped out. I mentioned here that Moses goes back to great realities of God, his purpose and his promise. Uh, that's what we need to do. That's the bottom line in prayer. We need to go back to the will of God, as Scripture teaches us what that will is. Uh, what has he said? What are his promises? What is his program? Where is he going? and to learn to pray along such lines like in Romans 8 when it's taught about the Holy Spirit helping us in prayer remember Romans 8 26 and 27 praying kata theon according to God or according to God's will or uh, John 15 7 if you abide in me and my words abide in you you shall ask what you will because what you will in such a case as it's impacted by his words abiding in you, will be what he wills. Again, in 1 John 5, 14 and 15, his commandments become so important in prayer that we pray in accordance with those, and then we will get what we ask for. Because it's assumed in such a case that we're praying in line with the will of God. His great purpose, his promises, what he's about, and so on. Or praying in accord with his very person, his very character, as Scripture tutors us to understand it. And we're not just praying, asking for things that would only satisfy our lusts in one way or another. Not our lusts, but his lordship uh, drives us in prayer. And so we see in three different reasonings here, Moses gives us such a very powerful passage on uh, how we also can pray today. Pray likewise. Except that with us, things have moved on several hundred years, haven't they? And God's purposes have progressed much farther uh, within our day than they were, had, had done so far in Moses' day, right? We're much farther along in the, in the uh, redemptive scheme now than he was. But still, the bottom line is the same, isn't it? God's will. Katatheon. According to God. 
Kata according and Theon God. According to God. Romans 8, 26, 27. So oh, if you have questions, please feel free to raise them up here. If I can answer them, I hope I can. I hope I can do better than I did on the first one there. Uh, just comment on this issue of God changing his mind that comes up in this passage. Yes, I believe that uh, probably those theologians are correct in uh, Exodus 32, 14 and so on, who, uh, as they look at all of Scripture, they teach that in one great sense, God doesn't really, not really change his mind because he, as God, has thought through everything and even willed it, uh, even has a decretive purpose in which things are certain. And uh, should they change, then that would show that God had not thought through, nor, God could, nor could God control things to make them work out properly. And what would they do to God then? That would diminish him. It would cheapen him. So in one great sense, he has not really needed to change. He has not changed. But that the change is spoken of more from the standpoint of uh, how man perceives him. In different situations, uh, from the human standpoint, man perceives God to have changed in the differing ways that he might work in different cases. But as far as the uh, overall will of God already uh, decreed, uh, things do not change. It's rather from man's own perception that they appear to. Another way to explain that, uh, I read a journal article of a Hebrew word study on that. Um, I wrote a, an article on, um, on the relationship of, um, of uh, faith and repentance in salvation in the Christian life and, and, and read that paper uh, in the 1989 national ETS held in the area of San Diego. And uh, in that repentance paper cited this one scholar who had a second, uh, second way of explaining that too and that is that the word for repentance there used in Exodus 32:14 and a few other cases in Scripture, I believe in Genesis 6:6, 6, 6, and so on, is a word that um, was even used for the snorting of a horse. It was a word um, in some texts used for one's emotions when one would breathe a sigh of sort of a sigh of of emotional um, emotional feeling. So that it would not be that God, uh, literally in our sense, would be changing, but rather that he, in his emotional involvement uh, with this case where his people had sinned in the golden calf episode, and in this uh, emotional desire that God had for Moses to step in and become a um, greatly used man pleading for Israel in their accessory vigil, was, uh, so to speak, breathing his own d divine sigh emotionally uh, of a great desire that things would work out the way that uh, would then fit with his already set uh, eternal plan. So that in either of the two explanations, God does not finally himself change, but rather he um, works in certain cases uh, where he might appear to be changing from man's uh, own puny limited standpoint but is not actually doing so and it, it fits in with this whole uh, scheme of uh, recent years of uh, open theism and those who have accused God of having to um, uh, to work with a system of not really knowing what the future holds in every case and sometimes getting surprised with what happens it was he couldn't have known ahead of time and with that kind of a God you don't really have God you have a rather very diminished God who is not really sufficient and cannot be the almighty, all-knowing God of Scripture. I fall with those like John Frame, who's written a book on this, Bruce Ware, who's written a book on this, probably the best one yet, uh, who insists that, um, that God does know all things ahead of time and has even decreed ahead of time and can never be shocked or surprised uh, when things happen. He, he always knows. And uh, sometimes uh, people have taken such examples to teach open theism as Genesis 22, where God sent Abraham to offer Isaac. And then when Abraham had offered Isaac obediently, 
Remember then the Lord said there in Genesis 22, now I know that you fear me. And they'll snatch a verse like that. It's, oh, so he didn't know ahead of time because he says, now I know. But rather it should be understood to mean something along the line of in personal experience, those things that I already eternally knew are, are being experienced here, actually enacted here in this case. Now I know this as it personally comes into experience, but not denying that he's already known it um, ahead of time. But just meeting him in the case of the moment. Most of the books like those by Bruce Ware, John Frame, Travis will, you know, deal with that very issue in some detail. Also, your, your systematic theologians like uh, Charles Hodge and Louis Burkhoff uh, in their sections on repentance and what it means. And they'll give you uh, the essence, they'll give you the verses that are, that are strategic. So will Louis Berry Chafer in his systematic, eight-volume systematic theology and uh, many of the others, Wayne Grudem, a number of others. And then also when you, when you take the great commentaries on Exodus, or Genesis for that matter, Genesis 6, 6, Exodus 32, 40, these great commentaries like Victor Hamilton, the two volumes on Genesis, or even um, John J. Davis, Paradise to Prison, a briefer, more overall uh, commentary on Genesis, or the great commentaries on Exodus. You, you will find that uh, they will, when they come to these individual verses, will, will deal with that. So as far as your planning messages or getting ready to um, give input on this, you, you've got plenty of help there, which uh, you can freshly come to in each case of each message you're preparing. Uh, the help of systematic theologies, the help of uh, commentaries, the help of journal articles, um, sections in particular, books on particular subjects like open theism, for and against, and so on. Well, feel free to ask any questions now about Moses or Samuel as we're moving along through these notes. The great passage in 1 Samuel chapter 12. Verse 23 particularly where Samuel says, Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, for the Israelites, but rather than sinning, I will instruct you in the good and the right way. That's the way of God's will. If a person is a true servant of God, he will instruct people along such lines and not uh, concoct his own ideas, as so many uh, cult leaders do. Even this man that was arrested uh, for uh, kidnapping Elizabeth Smart, that case that's now much in the news, who claims to be Emmanuel. And... Um, apparently was seeking to have seven wives, one of whom would be Elizabeth Smart. And feeling that he had, um, he had the knowledge to um, do what he wanted to do because he was God. So on. But it doesn't fit in with the uh, teaching of Scripture. Nor is he really submissive to that teaching, but rather he devises his own ideas to fill, fill his own lusts or his own twisted, twisted brain, and so on. Israel is, is involved in sin in, in 1 Samuel 12, as in many passages, and here is a man who is willing to stand up and pray for them. Not only to pray for them, but to wed with his prayer the Word of God in a blend that will impact them and help them to know God's will. That's what we're called to do. And he feels that he would sin if he went counter to God's will in God's own covenant plan. His plan to do good for Israel. So is the heart of Samuel to do good for these people. By praying for them, by teaching them God's word. Okay, Hannah, and that's the uh, same name, the Hebrew name here for Samuel 1 as the Anna, the, the Greek word in Luke chapter 2. Praying that she would bear a son. 
And then God gave her the son, Samuel. Then she gave the child, Samuel, to God. And uh, she had promised him that she would do that, and she followed through in doing that once she had the son. God also gave her other children, right? So God gave her even more than she asked, and that's Ephesians 3.20. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. Uh, sort of that idea centuries ahead of Ephesians. And then she prayed thanking God in verse 27. So we did see different elements like petition, thanksgiving, an attitude of uh, faithfulness to follow through on promises, and so on. And then, Ephes uh, then uh, 1 Samuel 2, where she gives her own song or prayer, yeah, she rejoices over what God has done, and even mentions in verse 10, the anointed one, the Messiah. The first, first passage in the Old Testament that uh, mentions the Messiah, the anointed one. I believe that she is like uh, Jacob in Genesis 49. Remember, J Jacob in Genesis 49 was able to rise above his own knowledge as he was moved by the Spirit of God, and even to speak of a future Shiloh. Uh, one in David's line who would wield the um, ruler's staff. Thus, to speak uh, centuries ahead of time of the Messiah, the one who would be the king in Judah's line. So I believe that by the Spirit of God, Hannah was able to speak above her own knowledge and to say more than she knew at the time. Uh, she was moved by the Spirit, and she's, she even mentioned the anointed one. Kind of what, what, what I would call an embryonic early statement of of that hope. Did she know all of that? No, not of herself. Just as uh, often I'm in the Psalms, David did not know all the things having been realized yet. They hadn't been. But he was able to be used of the Spirit to speak of things beyond his own inkling. Supernatural work there. And if we are available to God as his good servants, we will find ourselves doing things above our own abilities too even by the Spirit. Not giving new prophecy, because I believe God has finished that and given us adequately within Scripture. But we will, in principle, fulfill that by doing things far above our abilities. We will step out into a realm of doing things by God's ability. Uh, the Christian life was never a calling for us to do what was hard. It was a calling for us to do what was impossible. That's what we've been called to do but he provides that supernatural grace in which to do it, as he did for Hannah in, the, in, in that particular kind of way. David, we, we could write of so many different uh, passages there, and uh, of course, uh, who, who was it? Uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who wrote the, the seven volumes, The Treasury of David, uh, to give his uh, exposition of the 150 Psalms. And even books are coming out today that are spin-offs. New printings, like Beside Still Waters in our bookstore, that takes some of the key teachings out of those seven massive volumes, puts them in a little book about this thick, a very selective list of topics, uh, devotionally that would help uh, people to uh, just have these uh, one reading per day to grow on the good things that Spurgeon wrote. Uh, just a very small part of the seven volumes. He has another book as well that deals with, that's in our, in our bookstore, uh, another book that deals with uh, some of the selective um, few things out of uh, the seven volumes. So really, there are, there are just many prayers. Uh, much of what's in the Psalms would be prayer in terms of praise, thanksgiving, either confession or petition or intercession. But we just have a small section here in the notes. First uh, Chronicles 17, 16 through 27. Where it speaks of God's wondrous plan in First uh, Chronicles 17, 1 through 15. Uh, in reference to building a house in regard to uh, not to the temple, 
but a dynasty, a household of descendants that God will form. Solomon will build a house for God, the temple that is, and dedicate it. But God has a plan to bring about a far greater house, a house in terms of defined as de the descendants, a dynasty of David, which will take us right on into the millennial kingdom someday. God's wondrous plan, God's worshipful prayer for that plan in verses 16 through 27. And then we have the different teachings on prayer like humiliation as David humbles himself in appreciation before God. We need to do that often with our thanksgiving praise. And then secondly, his exaltation in God's plan, the idea that God has so exalted David by giving him a place of usefulness in such a grandiose scheme. And by the way, he's done that for you and for me. And that we have a very exalted place in Christ Jesus. According to Ephesians 2, 1 through 6. And he's raised us up and made us sit together in the heavenlies in Christ even. Very exalted. And thirdly, adoration of God, verse 20. Fourthly, affirmation and question that he has. And so we see several of the key elements, we might call them, or aspects of prayer or attitudes of prayer coming out here in this one prayer passage. Petition, let God's will be done, verses 23 to 27. And then we see how that petition, that God's will would be done, mingles with praise, as often we see it in the Psalms. Let that be often the case in our lives that whatever we would bring in terms of addressing our own personal needs before the throne of God, uh, we would season it with, uh, with much, uh, with much uh, prayer of uh, praise. And that's what uh, Philippians 4, 6 is teaching us. And everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. See, you see how it appears there? New Testament ground there uh, for us for sure. And then Solomon, in this case, it's very unusual because when God appears before Solomon, 1 Kings 3, uh, he is sleeping. And it's within a dream of Solomon that God appears to him and gives him an opportunity to ask whatever he will ask. Remember that? And at first, that really bugs people. It bugged me. You know, I thought, how could that take place in a dream? And we have all these people... That, today who claim dreams and they claim they've received things from God in dreams. Well, let me say quickly that there's, to me there is a great difference between people today who upstarts who claim they have uh, a word from God in dreams and what appears in what we call revelation in scripture where it's for sure within a context of God Almighty being at work. No uh, doubt about it. And it's within the context and within the fabric of Scripture, not within the context of merely this world society where people will, uh, even in uh, lives that are not doing God's will, will claim to have a message from God. Very different. And remember, I, I said here, it's under God's superintending auspices in this case. Keep that in mind, men. That when God gives him this opportunity to ask what he will, and it's in a dream, the context clearly shows this is something that happens under the superintending auspices of God himself within Scripture. So it has to have God's satisfaction here upon it. No doubt about it. It has to be something that's within his will here. We can count on it here. And we realize that God is able sovereignly, he is sovereign, to work in dream visions as he did with Joseph, as he did with Daniel, as he did with Nebuchadnezzar. Those were in dreams also. But it's the Almighty God at work, for sure, within the context of Scripture itself. And it's not just as people today will snatch up the opportunity to claim that they had some fresh word from God, as this man who uh, took away Elizabeth Smart has made such claims that he had a revelation that he was to have seven wives. 
And of course, as we look at that matter, what gave him the right to go into her home and snatch her away? Would God do that? What gave him the right to keep her all those nine months away from her family? You see, things are incongruous. They don't add up in regard to truth and righteousness, doing what's right, what's fair, what's good. Uh, so it's different from the context of Scripture. Uh, line four, when God so has his way within a dream, genuine desires of the human heart, already etched within the character in normal life stream, are then led to find expression. Uh, although I never would claim any divine revelation for it, I, c I can claim that in many of my dreams, for that matter, things that I've thought about, dwelt upon, will, will sometimes reappear in my dreams. Uh, people who appear in my dreams appear in character. If they're good people, they appear as good people in the dreams. But that's not scripture. That's not, I would not claim that as, as if I have any right to put that forth to people as a message for them. Rather, I would go to the uh, revelation of scripture. But where it, it pleases God to do so, if it's part of his own will and plan, he then can take things that have been etched into people's character and supernaturally cause them to reappear in dreams and cause the very desires of Solomon's heart that God should be glorified, that his people would receive good teaching to come back into his consciousness, and that would be what he would ask, and not for great riches and so on. At that early point of his life, at least, Solomon was wanting to do the will of God. Later on, he really fell away into gross uh, disobedience with many wives and so on. He tried many different schemes, if we, if we uh, can believe, and I believe we can, that Ecclesiastes is uh, something that he wrote. The different schemes he tried to find uh, fulfillment in, in Ecclesiastes 1 and 2. But as long as in his young days he was really seeking the will of the Lord, God could take those and, and cause them to appear within a dream, and he could ask him what he really wanted, and even within the dream he could be guided by the supernatural power of God to ask for what was right. Very unusual, very rare, of course, yet it happened. It happened within the context of Scripture. Uh, the last two lines, God put his wisdom in this praying man to do justice. And it is illustrated in, in uh, Solomon's decision concerning two women and a baby later. Within the dream, he desired to do that for his people. And then within his conscious life after the dream was over, he did that as he was led by God as well. Question, comment, Carlos? I was wondering if you could comment on your understanding of, uh, I don't know if it's a dream per se, but to perhaps like when the Lord speaks to our hearts, not in an audible way, but almost a, an unction of the Spirit where He leads and guides us. I, I'll give you a specific case. Um, I had such a, I guess we call it a subjective experience when I felt the Lord call me into the ministry. And uh, yeah, I didn't hear anything until I have it sitting open. It wasn't a dream, I was awake. Um, maybe you could comment how we should understand things of that nature. Again, it's probably above my knowledge, but I would say this, that uh, and the question is, uh, when we have these subjective experiences, for example, a person not in the ministry um, has within... Um, his subjective thinking, a, um, uh, an impression that he should go into the ministry. Uh, how are we to treat these uh, so-called subjective experiences? How are we to evaluate them? I would say this, that uh, from my own standpoint, my, my, uh, my uh, modus operandi here, my means of operation would be to always to check them out by the clear light of Scripture itself to be sure so that I would never allow my life to be driven by, merely by human impulses that I could not be certain about. Because feelings come and feelings go and feelings can be deceiving. It's like Luther said that, my warrant is the word of God, not else is worth believing. 
So I would always want to use the true Bureau of Standards, just as we have a Bureau of Standards for meters and things in Washington, D.C. Uh, so we have a Bureau of Standards of Scripture, of revealed truth. And we need to take any kind of experience that we might trot forth as uh, we think maybe has come from God and test it by Scripture, by the Bureau of Standards. To be sure that it checks out with uh, what we know for sure from a number of different considerations is the truth of God. And then be sure on the basis not of our subjective thinking, but sure on the basis of the tutoring of Scripture itself. Another... Uh, also, another um, attendant factor would be uh, checking it out with wise, spiritual, spirit-led people. For example, in 1 Corinthians 14, where the different uh, spirits of different prophets are checked by others uh, so that there's a testing to see whether someone is just giving the prompting of his own subjective thinking or whether he's giving something that the others can validate surely must have come rightly from God. Scripture itself and Scripture taught people would be, it would be better uh, validations than uh, uh, merely to trot forth one's own subjective thinking, however sincere he may think uh, he is. And he may be sincere, but at least it needs to be tested. Yeah, I and, uh, counseled on those lines. I went straight to my pastor and uh, found out later that one of the elders of the church had been praying for me that I would answer God's call. Um, you know, for Timothy three, it's a good work that if a man aspires to the So you know, taking that stuff out, I mean, I look back on it now, I see it. There was definitely that. But I, I remember when it happened, I was really afraid. Like, yeah, my is this just my own feelings? And well, you're like a wheel of a wagon or a car. You you've got the hub. And then you've got the different spokes or different steel points that move out from there. And these might be taking the hub, which is the very will of God within Scripture, and then someone praying faithfully in a holy way, in obedience to the Scripture, guided by the Spirit, praying for you, we would be like one of the spokes. Or wise counselors in the church who've walked with God, who are in a good position based upon their knowledge of Scripture to guide you as to whether you're subjective experience uh, would seem to be uh, God's will or uh, maybe you better uh, put a red light up there. Um, another spoke. In the multitude of counselors is safety. Even the Proverbs have that principle and so on. But of course within the, within the stream of wisdom within the Proverbs uh, there's not necessarily any wisdom in just going to a whole bunch of people to get counsel because they may be not taught by the Lord. They may be very unwise people. You go to some people and get counsel for them, they would lead you right into a life of adultery or whatever because that's the lifestyle they live. But within the stream of wisdom in Proverbs, it's, it, would, uh, it would contextually be wiser to go the way of what the Proverbs in principle are teaching us continually, uh, to seek the will of God that kind of wisdom, the true wisdom, not the wisdom of this world. 1 Corinthians 1, again, reminds us of not going the wisdom of the world, but uh, the wisdom of God, which, like through the cross, is even wiser than the wisdom of men. But again, it's the hub, the scripture, it must be our, uh, uh, our basis, it should be. Okay, let's stop here for a brief break. We've gone a little bit past the time, but we'll take our full 10 minutes to do that. We'll continue on. We um, are skipping over Hezekiah because I dealt with that great passage when the uh, Assyrian army was assaulting Jerusalem, number 10 there, and where he went to Isaiah. We looked at that earlier in the class and went through a number of points on that. So we go back in your notes and he picked that up. Then we have Nehemiah or Jeremiah. And we see, I, I've just done this very simple outline, concern, counsel, and call, or challenge. His concern when he had tears as he wept for his people, 
You go to uh, Psalm 6 in uh, Spurgeon's The Treasury of David, and he calls tears liquid prayers. Uh, when we pray with tears, they're kind of liquid prayers. And a good illustration of that is Hezekiah in uh, Isaiah 38, where he, remember, was ill, and he turned his face to the wall, and it looked like curtains for him, and, and he prayed with tears that God would help him. And remember, God gave him 15 more years. Liquid prayers. Psalm 6. Uh, Spurgeon coins that phrase. And so we see Jeremiah as a prophet of tears. Then B, we have counsel. God tells him not to pray for the sparing of these hardened people. That is, apparently they've gone so far in their obstinate uh, sin that they're at a point where they're not going to turn around. Very much like in the ministry of Jesus. Uh, when you get past, uh, and actually up to uh, Matthew 12, where Israel had heard his words, they had seen his mighty works, and uh, they had looked at both of these credentials. And as one man said, they had examined his credentials and decided that they were the credentials of hell. He said that he was doing it by Beelzebub, when actually uh, they were attributing to the very Holy Spirit of God, they were attributing what the Holy Spirit of God was doing to an unholy spirit, which was really sin, the unpardonable sin. Matthew 12. And very much like uh, the people in Jeremiah's day who had gone so far that uh, they're not, not going to repent. They're, they're past that point. And so it's interesting that in such a context, in 15.1 uh, of Jeremiah, even though Moses and Samuel, both of these having been such great prayer warriors, even if they should be here to pray for these... Um, people to be spared. God would not say yes. Because where he must judge, he must judge. His will must be done. And people are not going to make a difference even though they're great prayer warriors. Again, God is in the saddle. We're not. Uh, no matter how we may rise up in usefulness for God in, the, in, uh, in God's uh, holy business. Uh, until God is in charge, we're not. Uh, Moses and Samuel were not in charge. Uh, look with me for a moment at Jeremiah 15:1, then, and then also in uh, Psalm 99:6. And these verses sort of go together, and will throw some light upon the situation. In Jeremiah 15:1. Then the Lord said to me, Even though Moses and Samuel were to stand before me, my heart would not be with his people. Send them away from my presence and let them go. Well, we see that sort of truth in Romans 1 as well. Remember that? God gave them up, God gave them up, God gave them up. Where people have insisted in their obstinate unbelief upon going another way, in a sense they harden themselves, they become hardened, and they're not going to turn around. Whether it's in Romans 1, or Jeremiah 15, or in the ministry of Jesus. And then uh, Psalm 99, 6. Ninety-nine six. Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called on his name. Notice how he's singled out as a representative great case. He was among those who called on God's name. They, and notice they, plural, they called upon the Lord, and he answered them. So we have Moses and Aaron and Samuel in this case. Uh, Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Actually, Samuel both a priest and prophet. And so we have cases like Jeremiah 15.1 and Psalm 99.6 where we have a uh, great glimpse at uh, especially great prayer warriors. But as great as they are, in a case where the people in their unbelief have uh, obstinately gone too far, uh, then um, prayer warriors are not going to change the situation. Because after all, what's going to be done the will of God? 
whether you're uh, just a um, young believer or an older, very experienced warrior in prayer. And of course, the real warriors in prayer taught by Scripture would want the will of God and not want to go against it and say, well, I want my will, you know. I think it should be done this way, uh, not against the wisdom of heaven. Uh, Gavin? Back to Jeremiah 15.1, when the Lord tells them to stop praying, uh, that would be the height of arrogance for any of us to stop praying for someone, because that would be presuming a position of God. The height of arrogance? That if we were to say, I'm going to stop praying for somebody. Uh, obviously, God can, can tell us to do that, or He told you gentlemen to stop doing that. But okay, let me see if I can phrase this for the video audience here. And uh, if I'm not correct, please correct me. Uh, in light of um, Jeremiah 15:1, stop praying for these people. Would it be the height of arrogance for us today uh, if we should not keep on praying for people? Okay. Well, you know, I don't have a special word from God as Jeremiah did in this case, in context. I can't claim that. So, as far as I know, even when I find people are obstinate, like for many years my dad was, and it seemed he was the impossible case because he had all the answers every time against uh, any need for Christ. He said, Jim, if you get as old as I am, you've been around to as many places as I've been, you've picked up a little religion here, a little of this, and put it all together as I've done. I'm a good man in the community, and if any man will make it to heaven, I will. Besides, Jim, uh, if Jesus Christ were God, he didn't need to be a victim on the cross. He could have come down from the cross and escaped it. But Dad, he stayed there on purpose. It was part of the plan. It was prophesied in the Old Testament, and so on, that he, he must pay the penalty for our sins. No, Jim, you got it wrong. Go on. And yet, we kept on praying for him, this obstinate, hardened man, and he got saved. So as far as I know, we, we can continue to pray for people, as, Spurge, as um, Mueller did, uh, like um, 40, 50, 60, some 63 years in some cases, and then he died, and some were, were even saved after he died. And he'd been praying for these people. As far as I know, keep on praying for them. And that will be not a sign of arrogance, but it will be a sign of uh, sweet submission and a real concern. And trust, because we believe that God still is able. But should I receive some special word from God, as Jeremiah did, then, then I better follow him. You know, <laughs> I'd say it that way. I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, yeah. And then thirdly, the call or the challenge in 33.3. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which you do not know. Uh, I don't know, you read these notes. Did you, did you uh, maybe you, you might have even taken the uh, opportunity to look up the passage there. And we could do that right now together. It was very interesting to me when, having been taught through Campus Crusade for Christ on our Arizona State campus, that verse 3 was a very great verse, and I had memorized it, but out of context. I didn't know what the context was talking about. I just call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things. And we were thinking in terms of people getting saved on the campus. We had 42 get saved my senior year there as we witnessed to people. We had appointments, a little white bench out there in the park there, part of the campus, and we would uh, line up appointments, talk to individuals. We saw 42 of them come to know the Lord. And that was what our prayer was about. Uh, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things like people getting saved on the college campus. But then I looked at the context later. And I saw that the context beginning in verse 4 and following for many verses then uh, spread throughout this chapter talking about the um, Lord's plan to bring his Israeli people back into the land someday. They're scattered, but he'll bring them back and restore them into their land. <laughs> and restore their, their land objects to them and in the millennial, the kingdom blessing. So it's, it's really in context talking about calling to me in regard to that great prophetic plan I have uh, for my people. 
in which I pledge to bring them back into their land. Call them to me and I keep calling like this and I will, I will answer this prayer. I will bring them back. And so he will. You go on and read from verse 4 and verse 6. Read on through the um, chapter, you'll see that, uh, or Jeremiah 33, and not Ezekiel. Jeremiah 33, you'll find that that's what he's talking about, is the restoration of Israel to their land. It's only in principle that we can take it and say that the same God who gave this for Israel is a God who is almighty and able to do great things for us as well. But then we would have to test it out in individual cases to see whether those individual cases, you know, themselves have factors that fit in with his will. And we would need to be patient there and sift it out and check it out and until we would have a sense of confidence to keep on praying in such ways. Lest we misuse a passage that was really itself talking in context about Israel. Principle only there for us. But God can uh, indeed keep the principle in our case too if it's his will. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and unreachable. A word that's used for people inside a besieged city with thick walls between them and the outside enemy. And they were un unassailable, they were unreachable. There was no way the enemy out there could get to them. And there are these blessings that appear to be unreachable. The impossible. Beyond reach. And I will do these things. They appear to be very unlikely at the moment. Uh, as Israel being captured by the Babylonians, it looked like totally impossible to ever to, uh, to uh, restore their uh, destroyed cities and Jerusalem and so on. Now, in the world, could that ever come to pass? And, of course, the uh, message of the New Covenant in chapter 31 and the latter part of chapter 31 where God will restore even geographical uh, landmarks. That's in the closing verses of chapter 31. Uh, chapter 32 where, you know, um, is there anything too hard for me? The Lord asked. And the answer is nothing is too hard for me. And then in another verse in that same chapter, Nothing is too hard for you, <laughs> Jeremiah says. And that's in a context where the Babylonians are there. They're obviously possessing the land. Or they're ready to possess it because their armies are there. And it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, the, the writing is on the wall, so to speak, that they're going to conquer. And yet uh, God has Jeremiah purchase a piece of land in the very area that will become domain for the Babylonian armies. And then trust God that this document he puts in a piece of pottery for safekeeping that shows that he owns this land, that this land will be his someday, for sure. The impossibility of impossibilities. Chapter 32, and it's in that kind of a context that we come into chapter 33, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and unreachable. I mean, how in the world could it ever work out that that, that deed that's been placed in that uh, piece of pottery could ever be uh, plucked out of there and presented and uh, the land would be his because uh, it's, it's in the possession of the Babylonians and they're very mighty and so on. Uh, contextually, a very um, impossible, seemingly impossible thing. So that is Jeremiah 33, 3 in its context. And let's hope then that we will use that principle, though, believing that we still have the same great God that Jeremiah did. But check it out with other scripture. Daniel. I mentioned that I have an article on that that uh, you can always refer to. They'll give you far more than we cover in class. On much detail in uh, Daniel 9, when Daniel prays that God will do three things. Bring back the city, <laughs> bring back the temple, bring back the people in a restored condition. And then the angel appears to him and gives him this great, what we call the prophecy of the 77s, the 70 weeks of Israel, in uh, 9, 24 through 27, and says, God indeed will bring back the city, bring back the holy place, bring back the people in the future kingdom blessing, in his own good timing. And he will start off with uh, 69 sevens that will bring us up to the cross of Christ. 
and then the anointed one himself will be put to death, cut off. And then there will be a 70th seven, a 70, 70th week of years, seven, seven years after a time of desolation, the future tribulation time. If we premillennials are right in our interpretation of that, uh, there are many different interpretations of that. And many denials of the premillennial view. In fact, that whole passage, 9, 24, 20, 27, is, is kind of been a swamp of exegesis. One guy at Dallas Seminary wrote a doctor dissertation on just that passage and came up with a lot of liberal, a lot of Jewish views uh, that would almost curl your toenails. Uh, the ideas they put to that passage that seem to have no sense. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the, uh, the, the interpretation that has the most exegetical defense is the premillennial view that, that the 69 weeks will work up into uh, weeks of years, not weeks as we normally think of weeks. But it's literally in the Hebrew it says sevens. And there's seven, only, the only uh, uh, system that will work is sevens, not of weeks, not of days, not of months, but of years. And 69 of these from the time of the decree of Artaxerxes in Nehemiah 2, 1 through 8. Until the time of Jesus Christ. So that in, in Luke 19, 42, Jesus could say to the Israeli people, if, if you had known in this thy day the things that belong to your peace, this thy day, that is the day when the 69 sevens come into fulfillment. And, and, and the anointed one, myself, will be cut off. And then after the, 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 this fulfillment, for sure, literally, then a literal fulfillment of the 70th seven, a future tribulation time, in the book of Revelation and so on. All right, so that uh, is a great prayer. Bring back the city, bring back the uh, temple, bring back the people. Uh, the uh, great prophetic passage assures that God will do that in his own good timing, the steps that he will take to do it. And notice the last two lines is really the um, focus of that uh, prayer. It's God's sovereign plan within his uh, Abrahamic Davidic covenant program for Israel. His great sovereign promise coordinated with faithful human prayer that is according to his will. That we find out what God's will is within the scripture and his great earnest desire to um, bless his people in a land, in a kingdom. And then, because we take that seriously, as Daniel did, then we pray that God will work it out. And we become the custodians, we become the channels, in a sense. We become the co-laborers with God in the, uh, seeing the realization of that. He fulfills it by his own sovereign certainty. We get in on the blessing by being those who plead with him to do his very will. And then we have many other passages in Scripture like Jeremiah 29, 10 to 14, where that same principle, sovereignty, human availability in prayer, come together. And that's where I want to live, man. As, uh, once I see what God's Word teaches, as much as I can uh, have a growing understanding of this through the years, I want to pray in accord with God's will because I know I'm on the right track. It's the track of certainty then. And it cannot fail. But I realize that being human, being limited, there will be some prayers I pray that we get a no answer. But as soon as I'm assured that that uh, is God's answer, that I want to say, oh, so be it, Lord. Okay, thanks for teaching me that. Uh, we'll move on from here. Because in my prayer book on the right where I leave room for answers, most of the answers, I'd say a great high percentage are yes answers. Once in a while a wait, once in a while a no. But uh, many, many yes answers. And so it can be as God teaches us. Jonah, swallowing by the creature in, in chapter 1 is the great uh, sea creature takes him in when he's thrown overboard by the sailors. And then uh, that leads into his seeking and repentance. That's a prayer, 2, 1 to 9. And he, he gives his claim, his circumstance, as he's wrapped up with seaweeds and he feels the swirl and turbulence uh, underneath the waters and has this very deep prayer, way down prayer. And then his confidence in his center, his center is uh, the Lord in his holy temple. 
his conviction of faith that God must save him, his commitment to the Lord, and then the saving of Jonah in verse 10. God uh, causes him to be brought up in safety onto the dry land. He goes on and preaches faithfully in Nineveh. And notice the aspects of prayer in Jonah too. We have petition where he's asking God to help him. We have affirmation about truths about God. Then we have promise vow. He vows to the, makes vows to the Lord there should the Lord uh, restore him. His confession of his own guilt and then his praise to God. A number of the different key elements come together within one prayer. Some have taught, like J. Vernon McGee of uh, the uh, Church of the Open Door in Los Angeles many years ago, M. R. D. Hahn of the old radio Bible class, and a number of others have taught that Jonah had to die in order to be a type of Jesus who died. And Jesus being in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, Matthew 12, 40. But I believe the correct exegetical way to look at Jonah 2 is that we cannot find a single clue here that Jonah was dead. He was very much alive to be able to pray the way he did. And the point of Jesus in Matthew 12, when he refers to Jonah and makes an analogy between Jonah and the, and the Son of Man, is not the, um, the fact that uh, Jonah had to die as Christ died, but it's the time element, the three days and three nights, which is emphasized in the last verse of Jonah 1. And then, which is emphasized again in Matthew 12, 40. It's the time element. Three days and three nights in both cases. But uh, something in the Old Testament can be a type of Christ, or at least an Old Testament picture of Christ in some way, without it uh, you know, matching up with Christ in every detail. Every detail. We need to figure out exegetically what is the detail that needs to be matched. In this case, the time element not the death. And again, if you look at Jonah 2, he's very much alive throughout this prayer. We find no clue that he died here. We have to insert it if we put it in there. Okay, so Jonah, a very desperate, earnest prayer in Jonah 2. Uh, that is not the only prayer of Jonah. He, he stubbornly is uh, resisting God's will even in, uh, into chapter 4 and uh, very obstinate and uh, have a very sour attitude. Uh, but apparently uh, this guy who was willing to tell the goods on himself right up to the very end of Jonah and how guilty he was and how much he failed the Lord must have been a very humble man that, it, that he would be willing to tell a story like that about himself. It must have come out all right for him to uh, be humble enough to uh, Say, look, I'll just tell them exactly what happened, even though it doesn't picture me in a very good picture. Put me in a very good um, imagery here. Then Habakkuk, Habakkuk 1 through 3. He, he, he trots out this problem that he sees um, the law being flouted, chapter 1. It's as if the law is on a deep freeze, uh, people not obeying it. And he says to the Lord, Lord, why aren't you doing something? And then the Lord replies that he is doing something. He will bring this great northern invader down. Babylonians, of course. A bitter and hasty people. He bring them down in a piercing invasion upon Judah. And um, bring them as a purging instrument upon uh, Judah uh, f to take care of their problem of sin. And then uh, Habakkuk says, Lord, how can you use a dirtier people to purge a dirty people? We're bad, but they're worse. And then the Lord deals with that. And uh, even in chapter 2 tells us, I think it's five different reasons, step by one, two, three, four, five exhibits of their drunkenness and other reasons that God knows about and will judge in due time. He'll take care of them too. He'll take care of the Babylonians. But he moves in steps. And then chapter 3, a chapter of devotion, where uh, in prayer... In a song, Habakkuk is celebrating the great God of the past who has done exploits for his people. And then he says, uh, we couldn't be in a situation that's more bleak. The um, outlook couldn't be more bleak, but the uplook couldn't be brighter. 
because God will, even though the Babylonians invade and they strip the land of its vegetation and there's no cattle in the stall and all of that, what a bleak situation. Wow, is it going to work out well because he'll make my feet like hind's feet. Like one of these antelopes that has these suction type feet that will have traction upon the very uh, rocky ground and not slip and f fall. And I'll be that way. I'll have stability. God will take care of me. And the book ends on that note as he's uh, been engaged in much prayer. Prayer of confronting God, but not in an upstartish, impudent way. Too big for his britches, too big for his sandals, and so on. <sighs> but rather in a, in a heart that really wants to know. Proper questions. Lord, why aren't you doing anything? Lord, how can you bring a dirtier people down to purge a dirty people? Once God explains it, okay, let's go with that. I trust my God. And then the great worship in chapter 3 and ends on a very bright note. And let's, let's pray that like that too. Let's be willing to ask God proper questions, not to uh, challenge Him, but rather to find out information we desperately do need, honestly. But let's be prepared to accept submissively what His answers are and go with them. And let's still keep a, um, not a sourpuss disposition, but a bright trusting disposition. Because the future is as bright as the promises of God, as one person has said. And I think Habakkuk believed that too. The future is as bright as the promises of God. God will take care of us. And then Anna in the New Testament, one of the great women we see in prayer, her profession, prophetess. Her pedigree, a daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher. Her perseverance, 84 years. Her husband had lived only seven years after they were married. Then she was a widow, 84 years, so she must have been around 105 years old. And uh, if you'll read uh, I. Howard Marshall's great commentary on Luke, you'll find in there an illustration of back in the um, intertestamental Jewish literature, there was one of the other uh, women who was quite old, too, like that. Uh, so that Anna's age was very close to what that other elderly woman's age was, who was a great woman of God. Some of these women lived a long time. And then her prayer in the temple, its steadfastness as she served day and night, not meaning that she was necessarily in the temple all the time, but rather day and night like Nehemiah, Nehemiah 1, or Paul says he prayed day and night, not meaning absolutely all the time but meaning sometimes during the day, sometimes during the night, like the psalmist. Well, we waken at night sometimes and pray at midnight or early in the morning before we get up. Yes, day and night. Just the idea of uh, expressing means pray without ceasing. It's another way to say it. But not meaning that she lived in the temple 24 hours a day, absolutely. Some people take that view. Others say, well, since she prayed day and night, she must have had a special room, since she was such an honored woman of God, she must have had a special room assigned to her among the rooms that were there for the priests. They gave her a room, and she stayed there all the time. Others say, no, like, like Marshall, and I think rightly, or Plummer on Luke, no, she, she lived somewhere else because she, being a woman, had no right to be there assigned into the temple, but she prayed day and night. She was there part of the day, part of the night. She was just ceaseless. She was praying without ceasing, that kind of an idea. And then her perception, thankful about God's redemptive faithfulness, as she had some sense of knowledge from, that God's uh, word had given her about him being faithful to carry out his redemptive program. She was trusting him to do it. So she's a great example of a woman in prayer. I can read uh, books by women uh, that have written on prayer and learn from them. I, I want to learn truth from any and every source that uh, you know, can, can give truth. But that doesn't mean that I would say that a woman needs, uh, should have the right to be a pastor in a mixed congregation and all of that. Uh, I can learn from my wife. I learn a lot of things from her. I can learn from other ladies in the church. A lot of things. But that doesn't mean that I give them the right, biblically, exegetically, to be pastors over me. But do they have the right to be, um, teach Sunday school classes? Women? Yes, they have, they have 101 ministries in the church that they can rightfully 
uh, perform. And I think we ought to applaud those schools that, uh, you know, like uh, Talbot Center where I taught for many years that do teach people, uh, women, to get an MA so they can be trained. But let's not, not take their training and put them in bastards. And I think we move wrong, in the wrong way. Here's a great woman of God, however, who um, just really trusted the Lord in prayer. And she's a great example. Very much like uh, the Hannah of the Old Testament, or Samuel 1. I can learn many things from her as well. 